Good evening. I think Sarita lifted her eyes from her phone. Surprised that I'm speaking English to the crowd this, up, this evening. The NSC Park Hotel <coughs> and its director, Mr. Vicky Tane, are delighted to welcome you this evening for the launch of the book of Sita, Sita and Harris. Harris being the name of the husband, as you uh, have guessed, with the first name Ray. Ray, Ray. I suppose it stands for Raymond. No, not even that. Ray of Hope, then. Okay. So, the, the book of Sita, Sita and Harris, The Curse of Betty, which in fact concludes a trilogy started with a childhood in Port Louis, then later with Taming of the Brew, a novel, with definitely uh, of social overtones, with the perfume of tea in the background. Tea, which is your favorite beverage, I've been given to understand. That's why everybody will be on tea instead of wine and whiskey after. But before coming to the third title, The Curse of Betty, we can remain spellbound by the course of the life of Sita, Sita and Harris, from the Ward 4 in Port Louis, which Sarita must have known in our childhood. Me too. Me too. That's why I interviewed her, because she of this Port Louis origin. From the Ward 4 of Port Louis to the great capitals of the world, where are prestigious universities from India to the United States, to France and Canada, she has reaped so many diplomas which would take time to enumerate here. Suffice to say that she has the required qualifications in the multiple fields of a profession as an international civil servant working for the United Nations through many agencies such as UNESCO, UNDP, among others. And also well beyond, especially in the artistic field, diploma, for example, in art appreciation and aesthetics which she got from the university in India, I presume, yeah. For this matter, it is worth mentioning that she has also published a book entitled Author's Illustrations for Books, quite amazing, I must say, a collection of illustrations coming from a rich imagination. Coming back to the curse of Betty, the author herself qualifies the book as an epic tale of passion, loss, and inescapable destinities. The novel, in fact, is a saga covering three generations where the scenario requests, relates, sorry, a quest of roots and identity through the different stages of our history, French and British colonizations, with the plight of the slaves and indentured laborers, this time with bitter sugar in the background. I have been personally impressed by the details that you have portrayed in the book, which suppose that you have had years of research. You have been working on that a very long time ago. And in fact, when I opened the book, I fell on portraits. And this is where I started the book in the middle, in fact, with Port Louis, and then I flashed back, I, get, I got back, and then I started reading it <clears throat> as such. I must say that the, the Curse of Betty is not a history book. It's a novel on different history backgrounds. But it will certainly contribute to understand our history. 
And if I may say, so um, it's not a, a, a reproach to say that this is not a history book. It, many authors and those who are in this field know, let's take um, others uh, have been writing. You get Li Chiofan wrote about Chinese, the Chinese saga. I must uh, say also that uh, Joseph Salman Ken, um, Carl de Souza wrote about slavery and the Creoles. Assad Bagla wrote about Muslims in Mauritius. All these, fortunately, contribute to help us to understand more about our history. And I think that's very good. But the problem in Mauritius, I think you should know that, Ray, that we have a solid problem with history in Mauritius. Because everybody writes its own history. And that's the problem. From community-wise, I mean, first, and from a, an ideological posture at the same time. So the 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 l'enseignement, the teaching of history, has remained quite a, 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 a complex issue in Mauritius. In fact, uh, what is interesting to know, and I think Shenaz Patel has been doing that very often, writing novels but on history. Young la bande dessinée qui a été faite par par exemple par Shenaz Patel et uh, Jocelyn Chanlau. Il y a quatre bandes dessinées. To portray the poor state from colonization to Rodriguez, for example. So it's a, it's a way to bypass uh, the silences, as you say in, in, in your book, about some phases of the history of Mauritius. We thank you very much for this book, which I said will contribute to, to help us understand what is happening in our country. CETA has insisted when I said who will take part in the long book launch, said well, if I don't if if you don't choose my husband I'll be a dead woman. <laughs> You've been terrorizing this woman, Ray. <laughs> Ray works with the United Nations and she he, he just told me that he came here in nineteen ninety five to steal Sita away from, from the island. For those who like Netflix, I don't know whether you've been uh, watching Troy at the same, for the time being, no, nobody is watching this mini-series Troy, no, about how Paris went to a spout and then come back with Hélène de Troyes, and this provoked La Guerre que nous connaissons, Ray. A big applause for Ray. Some of you thought I was going to sell some ice creams this evening. But, uh, uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, great pleasure to see you all, and thank you very much for uh, braving the traffic and everything else uh, this evening. Um, and it's a particular pleasure to, to launch Sita's book this evening. Uh, and uh, I've been very close to it for, for some time, uh, and it's been a joy. And it's not only a result of her creativity, but particularly a lot of hard and consistent work, um, particularly in researching centuries of historical records, uh, particularly on this island. Uh, she has a passion for writing, which stems from the early encouragement, particularly of her, her mum, uh, and the opportunities that she took uh, at school. And one of her teachers is very kindly arrived this evening. Uh, and from our education activities at tertiary level. And that's probably where she got the bug for research. Um, and she has a particular eye for detail. In fact, uh, the teacher mentioned, Gosh, she's got such a good memory. She reminded me of things that I'd certainly forgotten from school days. Um, so it's that, again, the attention to detail, which I think is quite important for a writer. 
our own journey together, not only in, inter, in our international development and humanitarian work to places such as East Timor, Vietnam, Tanzania and other places, but uh, also philosophically exploring our innermost feelings and passions for the universality of human nature across boundaries and various cultures. I am particularly proud of Sita as she has a solid down-to-earth approach to things uh, and yet from that uh, humility, if you like, can scale the dizzy heights with amazing dedication with exhibitions in such places as uh, the Royal West of England Academy and National Art Gallery uh, where we also have Damien Hurst and Jenny Savile uh, exhibiting. Um, but just for now we'll probably leave her artistic um, achievements till later. Uh, she had a first international award for writing and that was in French uh, when she was in her teens. Uh, since then the day-to-day -day studying, working and living uh, leaves very little room in fact for creative pursuits. Um, for me the way that I would uh, try to encourage Sita was to sit down and write about all her ideas just to write, write and write. And she didn't disappoint. I watched, listened and read day in and day out all her words and phrases, tumbling down sometimes like a light shower and sometimes like a tumultuous cyclone. Back to the, curse of the work of an author is inspiring, uh, but we cannot underestimate the effort. Excuse me. The effort needed to have that consistent approach to writing. Uh, it reminds me of the Welsh poet Dylan Thomas, uh, and he was uh, a poet, uh, and he had a huge waste paper basket about this tall, where he would throw draft after draft after draft until the final accomplishment. Uh, and he lived down in my area of the woods in Lacha in South Wales. I'm still discovering uh, many of her other talents, whether it's in painting, uh, designing, illustrating, podcasting, YouTubing, planning, marketing, undertaking complex international work, uh, particularly in strategy and communication for, for the UN, uh, also dealing with operations in post-conflict countries. Uh, she's also known for her excellent baking and cooking skills, and needless to say, uh, I'm at the positive end of that. Uh, COVID has kept us quite local for a couple of years, but it's not stopped Sita from working at Prolstein on her various projects. Uh, this is her third novel, a trilogy, uh, part of a trilogy, as well as writing and illustrating two volumes of stories from the Indian Ocean, uh, which she also uh, will be publishing quite soon. Uh, but without an audience, writing can be quite a lonely pursuit. Uh, so I must thank you all for supporting Sita. Uh, those who are here and also her friends uh, away and also provide the support and feedback that every writer needs. Sometimes it might be negative feedback but it means you're reflecting and thinking about uh, a person's work and how they progress. Um, I'd like to read uh, one short extract to remind us um, that she's fully immersed in her country and uh, particularly in uh, her birthplace of Port Louis. Uh, I was born by the sea. This place. This place, Betty thought, as she looked across the bay, was in her bones. From here, Port Louis had not changed. She walked along the path for more years than she cared to remember. It became even more breathtaking. Far out across the land, beyond the winding river Dupuis, she could see the emerald glitter of the sea and beyond. She could make out the shadow of the harbour's rugged coastline with the oil silos and the Bay de Tombeau winding away in the far north. Betty imagined that beneath the scrubby banks, shining black basalt pebbles washed by the shores in the low evening sun and in the depths of the water, she fancied a lifetime of memories. So many of them played out against these riverbanks bordered by bridge walls within the belly of the city. Today, as always, it was exhilarating in its freshness, a landscape forever shifting, yet its fabric remained the same for all time. 
The straw green flanks of Signal Mountain from where the city started were surely smaller than in her childhood, as though the weight of time had obliged them to crouch just a little bit lower each passing year. It was perhaps the way islands morph our perception, she thought, making everything small and reachable. What was this tiny island to her, lost in the vast ocean? No doubt everything, yet nothing at all. Uh, one thing I like also about the book, it reminds me of some far-off places uh, like UP in India, Brittany in France, and also Zanzibar where we in fact worked. So if you don't mind, I will just pick another little extract. The sea and lagoons surrounding Zanzibar Island have always been a magnet to seafarers who stop by to enjoy the lush green environment to take a rest from long voyages. The island bathing in the Indian Ocean, awash with stunning fine sand beaches, offered turquoise clear waters where fish were abundant and bigger sea mammals brought their younger ones to rear in the warm shallow waters of the lagoon. The climate lent to the spices growing freely and soon travellers who discovered them started trading them, making considerable wealth. Yet alongside also came a demand for slaves. Men were captured and chained to be sent to ships which took them to the various shores where they spent their lives working in harsh conditions under slavery. Ubuara lived with his parents and two other siblings in a grass and mud hut along the coast from Stonetown, Zanzibar. His father looked after his small plot of land where he grew vegetables, corn, sugar cane, papaya and sweet potatoes. The excesses were sold by his wife in the local market while he fished for dorado, snapper, mackerel, and parrotfish. His catch was good. Most times he brought some crab, which he also caught in his nets, for adding to the cooking pot. Life was inconsequential, the boys growing up with happiness. One day, an Omani, one of the latest settlers on the island, came hailing in front of their house. Ubuar and his mother came out to see who he was and what he wanted. Where is your man? asked Zafa the Amani. He's not here. What do you want? Rebecca replied, not trusting the look of him. Ubuara hid behind his mother, peeking every now and then at his goatee bearded man in a long white jalaba, held by a velvet bed a belt, sorry, where a dagger was tucked in. The knife was most elaborately carved and studded with sparkling stones. Ubuara couldn't take his eyes off it. I have work to offer and looking for healthy, young, strong men, Zafar said, looking at the woman who had dark, shiny skin in sharp contrast to the bright, bold colors of the kitenge she had wrapped around her upper body. It was in bright patterns and colors, and she had metal and beaded, ju beaded sorry, jewelry around her ankles. Surely one of the Maasai women who married a local Zanzibari Bantu man. They are known to be tough and very vigilant of their close ones. Zafa had better be cautious. So he was a slave master. Uh, if I can just add one little section. Uh, Ma tante shared a story with them. There was a woman of Africa brought here to be a slave. One day she wanted fuel for a cooking pot. Didn't have any. Nor did she have the money to buy any. Desperate she was, and her children were hungry, so she stole some charcoal and she got found out. The old woman paused. This woman was fierce for her children, fierce for their lives. When she got found out, she proclaimed she didn't care, that she'd die for her children if need be. That was the worst thing that she could have said. She wasn't regretful about what she had done. She wasn't regretful at all, and the master, Monsieur Blanc, was angry. So they cart whipped her. A kind of adverse loyalty to plantation owners and more particularly to the de la Tour family made Mohan want to protest that this, this couldn't be true, that no man could do this to a mother who simply wanted to feed her family. But the words stuck in his throat. You know what that means, she asked him, he nodded. That means they tied her to a cart to whip her. In front of everyone, her children, her husband, they saw her bare back turn bloody with deep grooves left from the lashes. A heavy silence hung in the air. 
Baptiste shrugged. I didn't like hearing all that about whipping. It makes me feel very uncomfortable. Moa nodded grimly. It should make us all feel uncomfortable. A civilized man shouldn't have such a thing in his history. It's a blot in the soul. He fell silent again. He clearly didn't want to be reminded that Dula II's wealth was based on sugar and enslavement of others. He felt guilty to have married the master's daughter. So pleased that we thank you again once more. And uh, I'm very, very pleased and humbled also by the achievement of my wife. Ça a été plus une, un témoignage d'amour qu'une analyse de, du livre. I don't know if Liam Neeson is, uh, is Welsh. The actor Liam Neeson is Welsh. No. Uh, no, Irish. 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 I think, listen to you, I thought he was, he was getting a strong competition. <laughs> anyway, uh, c'est toujours avec plaisir que on, on entend la lecture de quelques extraits il y a quelques extraits du livre qui donnent uh, un peu le, le, le climat, l'atmosphère du livre en question. Et um, je suis tout à fait reconnaissant que vous ayez choisi de, la partie pour lui pour commencer. Uh, parce que j'ai été toujours uh, impressionné par des destins fabuleux. Qui pouvait prévoir uh, à l'époque, même quand elle avait terminé ses études dans une petite école primaire à, à pour lui et même quand elle a travaillé dans l'agence de publicité de Palmesh Qatari, qui est là aujourd'hui, que Sita allait connaître un destin aussi fulgurant. Il est évident que ce n'est pas le fruit du hasard, c'est le fruit du, du travail qui fait qu'on arrive à, à ce sommet et que, parce que rien ne nous, ne nous est donné gratuitement. Et moi, je suis assez fasciné par ceux qui sont d'extraction modeste et qui ont pu atteindre des grands sommets de cette manière-là et qui continuent, qui continuent leur vie. Donc c'est tellement avec beaucoup de plaisir que j'ai eu la chance de rencontrer Sita. Et puis que j'ai lu le livre et que j'ai eu la chance de l'interviewer euh, ce que dis, ce qu'elle disait était tellement riche qu'on a fait ça en, en deux parties. Euh, la semaine dernière, on a eu euh, la première partie. Et dimanche, euh, je suis désolé de faire un peu de la promo de cette émission, euh, dans Dimanche Culture pour la, la seconde partie qui va passer euh, ce dimanche. Ce qui est bien, si vous n'avez jamais entendu l'émission, ce n'est pas grave. Parce que vous allez la rater, forcément. Donc l'émission passe, la deuxième partie de l'émission passe ce dimanche à 11h. Donc sans plus tarder, on va inviter l'auteur à, c'est un peu la coutume, à dire quelques mots sur la... Je ne sais pas ce qu'elle va dire. Je peux quand même nous raconter l'accouchement de ce, de ce roman-là, combien de temps ça a pris, quelles sont les, les angoisses qu'elle a, qu a connues manifestement euh, quand elle écrit. Parce qu'on veut savoir aussi, je sais que c'est une curiosité malsaine de la part de ceux qui, qui écoutent, est-ce qu'elle écrit le matin Est-ce qu'elle se réveille à 3 heures du matin pour écrire Ou est-ce qu'elle dort dans la journée Ou elle, euh, pour écrire une page, c'est deux bouteilles de whisky Enfin, moi, je ne sais pas. Hein. Je dis ça comme ça. Est-ce qu'elle est dopée euh, comment, comment ça se passe Parce que l'écriture n'est pas facile. L'écriture est un, est un acte brutal et violent par la même occasion. Bon, ce n'est pas moi qui l'ai écrit, c'est elle. Un gros applaudissement pour Sita. Good evening, everyone. And thank you for being here this evening. Thank you, Hennessy Hotel, for hosting this event and providing this wonderful opportunity to relate live. Thank you to all my friends, relatives, colleagues who cannot be here this evening but are able to watch it online. 
I couldn't do justice enough to the one person who taught me so much and made me the person that I am today, my mother. She suffused resilience and passion in me from a tender age. She believed in me more than anybody else. And with whatever means she had, she made sure she garnered enough strength in me to carry through adversity. Sadly, she is no longer with us today, but I'm sure she would have been very happy to watch this event. She was, in fact, the first person who encouraged me to write, and I wish to thank a few people present here tonight. Beforehand, I give my thanks to the wonderful teachers that I've had, in particular, Mr. Julie Pambod, who is present here, who was one person who practically gave me a notebook as a prize for topping the class and asked me to write. So thank you, ma'am, for this. I cannot thank my friend Sadna Ramlala enough. She's not here tonight, but who proved to be as loyal as the rains and sunshine can be. Behind her craziness lies the most generous heart I have known and my biggest confidant and supporter. Dr. Sarita Boudou, affectionately called Didi, who from day one took me on board with equal respect and level to a delightful conversation I have had the privilege to exchange with her through the decades, especially during her epic journey of producing Kanyada. She is one rare gem this country has produced, and one of those who believe in work without expectation of any self-rewards. Palpesh Katari, who was my first boss when I started working in Mauritius in advertising, he is among the breed of very few men who shine by their gentleness and good nature on a constant basis. And thank you, Priya, for signing my first paper. That was memorable. I also wish to thank my new friends I have made over social media who come forth with passion and conviction in everything they do. They are forces to reckon with as children of this country, utterly devoted to their causes. Thank you, Ruben, and many others like you. And of course, I cannot thank enough Ray, my better health, half, for his unconditional love and support in this journey. Now it only makes sense for me to tell you more about this book. It is the third part of a trilogy. The previous two books are When the Stars Shine and Taming of a Brew. My journey into writing these no three novels started with an intense grief after losing my mother. As I am the only child with no father, it was more crushing to carry this grief by myself. One day, my husband, after witnessing my torment and all the images with memories resurfacing back to me from my childhood, asked me to write them down. And slowly, without me intending, it took the shape of a book. The first novel was born. Naturally, I felt I still had more to say and charted to amalgamate my thoughts into a creative process which resulted in the second novel. It felt there needed to be a conclusion, as I was only skimming over the issues and histories of my native island. Thus, the curse of Betty completed it. Furthermore, I don't know what will come forth for the next book, but you certainly will hear about it. The curse of Betty is set in the picturesque island of Mauritius, amid transitions in the island's colonial masters. The French brought the first African slaves, and it was the British Sorry. who took over the island who brought shiploads of indentured workers from India. The book exposes many social facets of the time. Here, cultures clashed, traditions baffled, the color of the skin mattered. With wild faith in supernatural beliefs brought by the tribal African slaves and the indentured Indian laborers, forged a way of life in their new land they call home. Tragedies hit those who are at the mercy of loving life, and hope is buried deep in law and taboos. This book, I would consider, is a significant contribution to the recent expansion 
of publications and research on Indian, Indian Ocean nation cultures, especially of forced migration. The cultural fusion depicted in the novel brings three worlds together, that of colonial masters, both French and British, African slaves, and Indian servitude workers. I chose to lighten such a heavy issue by interweaving it with a fictional story based on real facts. I have to admit that like many of my fellow countrymen and women, I seem to chart naturally towards sugarcane plantations and it's part of, it has played in the human history of this island. I have not lived in the sugarcane areas of the island, but everything about sugarcane appeals to me for good reasons. And this book had to find its way to complete what I had started from my previous novels. It is different from the books in a jar because I have written it in a hybrid style. This means that there are factually researched parts as well as fiction. Having said so, the academic in me always played its place, but the avid storyteller and the traveler found their way too. I wouldn't say I'm a staunch feminist but I do believe in the positive power of women. And this novel, like the other two, is also laced with women-centric characters. Needless to say, many of the books that I have read and loved were often subject to various controversies, specifically because they also dealt with the themes of female independence, sexuality, intellectualism, as well as female interrelationships. Although these books all belong to various genres, literary fiction, non-fiction, post-colonial studies, dystopian, graphic novels, contemporary literature, they have a common thread of continuity running through them. These follow women who are growing in one way or another, physically, emotionally, mentally, and as such are often placed in contrast against the largely conservative and patriarchal society. All of these women are rebelling, either directly or indirectly, against the society that strives to repress them. Some triumph, others die, quietly crushed by conformist society. I will now read you a couple of passages from the book. So many years have shaped this island nation into a maze of cultures, cuisine, and law. Betty thinks only of her mama, like many, who share the same past of their roots forgotten and lost. She was a stoic, hard-working, simple woman. She did not share her awful sadness that afflicts her at night. For the lack of bestowing her hard days to a kind ear she could call ma, or of a brother, or have a sisterly hug. There was none in her life. Betty thinks sadness in, is more prevalent among the islanders. She closes her eyes against the memory of that most unspeakable act of treachery, slavery and indenture. There is only the sound of the birds breaking the silence. Only nature pervades with wisdom and moves on, as if nothing ever happened. I'll continue by reading you to another one extract. Evil spirits do not only come from far away, they also are among us. Wherever they come from, they have bad intentions. This little creature has nothing to worry about. I'm here to protect her. He opened his other hand and placed it under Grandma's chin. She undid a knot on the side of a kitengi, wrapped it around, and removed the carving that my father had made for me and gave it to the wise man. His callous fingers felt it and found a small hole. He added other herbs and what looked like a tiny wood shaving to the small fire. A woody camphor-like smell filled the air, different from anything that I could imagine. As the fire died, he closed his eyes and recited strange words as he stirred the embers. Only ash was left. Concealing the carved amulet within his cupped hands, he closed his eyes and again recited some strange words. He then took a plaited fiber, passed it through the amulet, and hung it around my neck, and said, Always keep this on you, and the ancestors will protect you from evil spirits. He looked at Grandma and then at me, 
child, your father invoked the ancestors, uh, ancestors sorry, when he made this amulet. In this amulet, the voice of Africa is heard. It is the most powerful amulet that I have touched. I grasped it warmly in my both hands. My little pounding heart was light, and I felt secure, protected by the ancestors and the amulet that Papa had made. The wise man pointed his stick at the vacua mats on the other side of the tree and told Grandma that we should rest there until we were ready to go home. Grandma stood and bowed three times. She then, she then made that particular sound that she had made when we stood before the entrance of the tree-sized trunks. The old man smiled and we left him. The villagers brought us food and drink before encouraging us to rest. I was in the deepest sleep when Grandma woke me. The moon was overheard when we started our return journey. As we made our way up the hill, Grandma, I asked, what type of animal is Africa? She stopped and turned. Grandma said that she had never heard of the word before and that it was probably a special word used by wise men. I knew that the wise men were much wiser than anyone else. Uh, the last passage. <laughs> um, crossing the Kalapani is taboo. I know that by crossing the sea, I risk defiling my soul and confronting the monsters of the black water. Cut off from regenerating waters of the Ganges, my purified Hindu essence will be lost. The reincarnation cycle ended. My thoughts jumped to the Uttar Pradesh criminals required to cross water to serve imprisonment on the islands of Andaman and Nicobar. Like them, I will not return. Born into sadness, I will die in sadness, and now, not even on my own soil. A roll of the ship, and I shriek. Extended fingers grip on the iron balustrade, infidels dragging fawn briars through my insides. I lean over the side to, to vomit what little is left on my stomach, <clears throat> and eyes closed ride the angry waves, chanting, oh, praying that Brahma will tell me what to do. My chant continues until horse in the throat. I can chant no longer. I wait for my death, my lament, that I'm taken so young, having lived so little. Finally, my strength dissolves. Whitened fingers lose our grip. I slump on the boards, huddling, without recognition, my death surely having survived. It's an eternity of what have been may, may have been a moment before the rocking ceases. Watered eyes glance to a squall that has passed, the ship now making smoother progress. A surge of relief sweeps through me. The swell of the ocean continues to tie knots in my belly, but the palpitations inspired by the invisible monster's anger is abated. It is a miracle that has allowed my prayers to be answered. I discovered the magnificent works of Dame Sheldrake, if any of you have heard of her, when I was grieving for my mother. I could feel the deep hurt and trauma of having lost her so suddenly. And ever since, I have been fostering young orphan elephants who have lost their mothers due to poaching. To conclude, I'd like to let you know that I have chosen to give some of the proceeds from, if any, of the sale of the books to Sheldrake Wildlife Sanctuary in Nairobi, Kenya. This is where our nine baby orphaned elephants live happily, and our blind rhino, black rhino, black African rhino, and our known uh, Kiko, the, the giraffe, live. And they are taken care of there before they're released into Savo. Thank you for your attention. I will leave you to discover the book, and hopefully that you enjoy reading it.